of our entire workforce strategy team, I want to welcome you all to our discussion today on building a culture of worksite wellness. So we want to invite you, um, for those who have not already, to introduce yourself uh, in the chat with your name, your company, and the city where you are joining us from today. Um, our workforce strategy team hosts monthly webinars on um, different themes, different workforce themes, um, and you can access our 2023 schedule of um, to register for any of our upcoming webinars by going to our Deed Career Force Workforce Wednesday page. And so, for those who might be new today joining us, um, these events occur the occur the first uh, Wednesday of every month from 11 a.m. to noon, with an unplugged Q and A. Uh, session for the audience for the last half of our half hour of our time from noon to 12:30, in which all of our attendees can unmute and ask questions. And we'll go to the next slide. So our workforce strategy team works regionally with businesses to support talent attraction and retention strategies. And we serve as a connector with your local, regional, and state workforce partners and resources. And so when you work with us, you are automatically connected to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, and our communities. And so lastly, as a reminder, after um, the session today, a recording of the session along with the slide deck and then links to all of our resources that are shared will be available on our Career Force webpage. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we are really excited to launch our discussion today on building a culture of worksite wellness. And we are going to discuss ways that businesses can promote retention by supporting employee health and mental health in the workplace. Uh, next slide. And so wanted to review our learning objectives for today. So. Uh, we will learn about research and trends in what employees are seeking in their workplace. We will understand a framework for identifying dimensions of workplace mental health and well-being. And we will identify strategies to optimize employee well-being and retention. Next slide. So today we're going to hear from a panel of experts about tools and strategies to support employee well-being. We will be tracking your questions that you pose in the chat throughout the presentation that we will bring forward during our last half hour together during our unplugged session. So please feel free to use the chat to share your ideas and your questions. And then as a reminder, uh, we will record the first hour of our time together from 12 to noon. And then we do stop the recording for the final half hour when we start our unplugged uh, Q&A time together. Uh, next slide. So um, as some of you may know, uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we're going to incorporate some of our time on um, to incorporate themes of, around mental health, which is an important component of overall uh, well-being. And as a general theme today, we'll be focusing on this broader idea of supporting the whole person and the idea that physical health, mental health, and well-being are all intertwined. And so why is this important? Um, as you can see by this graph here, according to the Minnesota Health Department, uh, one in five U.S. adults live with a mental illness. And in a recent article from Quartz, we also see that three years after the onset of COVID-19, employee burnout in the U.S. is comparable to levels reported at the height of the pandemic. Um, the article also notes that uh, in Affleck's recent annual survey of U.S. employees, um, revealing that more than half of American workers are facing at least moderate levels of burnout. Um, another interesting data point from Gallup in their article, The Economic Cost of Poor Employee Mental Health, um, highlights that four out of 10 U.S. workers report that their job has an extremely negative or somewhat negative impact on their mental health. And so um, the research is telling us, and then Amanda, um, who's on our panel, will share more about some of these trends, that there really is a need for investments in both physical and mental health to support employee well-being and to engage and retain talent. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. 
So there is no one size fits all solution um, as uh, some of our panelists will um, highlight as well. And we know well-being has many ingredients and that these ingredients may differ from person to person. And so as such, um, companies should consider an integrated approach to employee wellness that incorporates many different aspects of wellness to help support um, individual needs, optimize productivity, and build a positive workplace culture and reduce absenteeism and turnover. So some examples that I wanted to note here um, that we are hearing about are around uh, flexibility. And so employers are increasingly embracing workplace flexibility by offering more options for their employees regarding when, where, and how work is done. Um, psychological safety. So uh, thinking about as a company, do you have a culture of trust in your workplace? And, and then how do you know? Um, do you have an environment where employees feel secure enough to be able to share their thoughts and ideas freely um, without worrying that they are potentially opening themselves up to negative reactions? And then another to highlight is um, social connections. And uh, our panelists have some really good examples uh, about what they're doing in their workplaces. But social connections, uh, we, are here, we are seeing that decades of research um, suggesting that the quality of our social ties might be the single biggest predictor of our well-being. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So uh, with with that, we're going to launch into our panelist introductions. And so uh, we have Amanda O'Connell joining us. Amanda is the Southeast and South Central Regional Analyst with the Minnesota Employment and Economic Development. Amanda has a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology from the University of Wisconsin Stout and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Minnesota State University Mankato. Uh, we have Maria Service. Maria is a former occupational therapist and is now a stress management consultant for high achieving purpose driven leadership teams. Her business provides interactive group workshops, keynote speaking engagements and online webinars to help high achievers stress less, improve resilience and find more joy in life. Uh, next slide. And then next we have Lena Murphy. Lena is a senior HR consultant with the city of Rochester. She has worked in local government for almost 10 years, partnering with leadership and employees to provide organizational strategies around recruitment and retention. She has also provided human resources support in higher education and manufacturing industries. Uh, next we have Julie Brock. Julie, Julie states that people are beautifully wired and deserve the right talent fit. This is the why behind Julie Brock's work. Julie Brock Consulting helps individuals, teams, organizations, and communities find their collective assets and helps each person gain confidence in their unique contribution. Next slide. And then last but not least, we have two representatives joining us from Albert Lee Select Foods. We have Charles Newton, the, uh, who is the HR manager of Albert Lee Select Foods, where he has worked for over 18 years. Albert Lee Select Foods has 450 employees working at two production shifts with a third shift sanitation crew. And then we have Candace Two, who joined Albert Lee Select Foods last year as a recruiter. Before that, Candace worked at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin as an HR assistant and is a graduate of St. Mary's University with a major in human resource management. Candace currently lives in Albert Lee with her family. And so now we're gonna go ahead and kick things off with Amanda O'Connell, our deed labor market analyst, to share some data on worker well-being and why it's important in our workplaces. So over to you, Amanda. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, I received my master's degree in industrial organizational psychology. And IO psychologists can help organizations improve um, the workplace by applying scientific principles um, to address various workplace topics and issues. And so what I'm going to be focusing on today is worker well-being. Next slide, please. 
So as we know, work takes up a significant portion of our time and energy. Um, and work can also significantly impact various aspects of a person's life as um, as their worker well-being, but also their overall well-being. Um, and also their physical and mental health and their relationships in work and out of work. Next slide, please. Low levels of well-being and work-life balance can lead to stress and burnout and other negative health outcomes. And there's research to support the relationships between healthy workplace practices and organizational outcomes such as job performance, attendance, absenteeism, turnover, productivity, and organizational costs. So as you can see on the screen, uh, this is just a diagram that shows the relationships between health, healthy workplace practices and how it can impact employee well-being and organizational improvements and vice versa. Next slide, please. So dig a little to dig a little further, we're going to um, look into the US Surgeons General Framework for Workplace Mental Health and Wellbeing. So it includes five dimensions, protection from harm, connection and community, work life harmony, mattering at work and opportunity for growth. So the first dimension is protection from harm. Um, people can't perform well when they are physically or psychologically unsafe. So organizations can help reduce these harms by removing physical um, hazards and psychological hazards. Um, and some psychological hazards would include uh, prejudice in the workplace, mistreatment, emotional aggression, and intimidation. The second dimension is connection and community. Um, as humans, we are socially inapt to make connections and want to connect with people. And we spend a lot of time at work. So I know personally when I have connections with my coworkers, it makes work more fun. Um, it's just a better place to come. And so having social support and relationships can increase a sense of well-being and connectedness, which can positively impact worker well-being and the culture of your organization. The third dimension is work-life harmony. Um, sometimes this is known as work-life balance as well. And so this is basically creating a balance between the employee's professional roles and their personal roles. I think um, a new thing that is going on in organizations is that we need to see people as the whole human being that takes on multiple roles, not just the one at work. So a lot of people have other roles such as caregiving. Maybe they're taking care of their um, elderly parents or grandparents, or they're taking care of their kids. Maybe they have community roles. Um, maybe they're volunteering or serving on a committee. Um, all these roles impact the workplace, and we really need to recognize that people are people. We take on multiple roles, and it does impact um, our work, our work life. The fourth dimension is mattering at work. Um, people want to feel respected and valued. Um, so organizations can provide a living wage for employees for the work that they're doing. Um, they can build a culture of gratitude and recognition um, and connect individuals, um, their work with the organizational mission. And lastly, they can engage workers in workplace decisions. So there's actually a company in Southeast Minnesota that I heard an example of this last week. Um, it's a manufacturing company. And they were trying to decide if they wanted to do four days a week uh, with 10 hour shifts or five days a week with eight hour shifts. And instead of the managers just deciding um, for everyone, they actually surveyed their employees to ask them what they wanted. Um, and that's just really important. That just shows that their empl the employer is taking into consideration other people and uh, what is going to affect their lives. The last dimension is opportunity for growth. So organizations can offer quality training and education um, and fostering a clear pathway for career advancement, um, which is also a really good recruitment and uh, retention strategy as well. And they can also ensure relevant reciprocal feedback. So I kind of told you what worker well-being is and um, wh so why is it important? Why should businesses prioritize this? Next slide, please. So as you 
all probably may know, especially if you are trying to recruit workers, um, we are experiencing a very tight labor market in Minnesota. Uh, so it is vital that organizations find strategies to increase employee retention and recruitment. So on the slide, you can see that for quarter two of 2022, there's about 185,000 job vacancies. Um, however, there are, there are about 73,000 unemployed people. So simply put, it is an employee's market right now and probably will be for a while. Um, and people are wanting worker well-being. They want organizations that are prioritizing their mental health, their well-being, their um, work-life balance. And there's also research to support this. So in a recent study, participate participants rated what, what was the most important factor when deciding whether to accept a job offer or not. And the top two responses were compensation, greater work-life balance, and personal well-being. So understanding what job seekers want um, from their next job is key to optimizing an organization's talent attraction strategy and retaining their top talent at their organization. Not only this, but people recognize when their employer puts in work to address their employees and their well-being. Next slide, please. For example, there is a study conducted by MIT Sloan Management Review. They um, analyzed over 1 million employee written reviews on Glassdoor from before the pandemic and then during the pandemic. And so as you can see on the graph, uh, the data shows that the employees' perceptions of workplace culture um, workplace culture positively spiked during the pandemic. And they gave their leaders uh, higher scores on communication and transparency during the pandemic than um, compared to other years. They also analyzed the top 10 topics that were frequently discussed before um, during the pandemic compared to before. And those were recession, mental well-being, transparency of leaders, health and safety, top team communication, diversity, inclusivity, race, and equity. So as you can see, people are valuing this. They are noticing this. Um, COVID was kind of a catalyst for this culture change in the organization. Um, and to keep up with recruitment strategies, it would, um, organizations should really um, understand what people are wanting and the culture they want in their workplace. Next slide, please. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind if your organization is going to adopt worker well-being strategies in the workplace is recognizing the diversity of their employees and the people in the community where they attract their talent. So one tool that organizations can use is the Social Vulnerability Index tool that is created by the CDC. So this tool can help organizations identify vulnerable workers um, based on factors of poverty, race, age, language barriers, and access to health care. Workers from social, socially vulnerable groups may face additional challenges and barriers to the workforce, which can impact their work, worker well-being and overall, overall well-being, um, which also impacts organizational outcomes. Next slide, please. So just a few examples about how some people's social vulnerability can impact uh, not only them, but the organization. Uh, the first two is access to health care and exposure to environmental hazards. Uh, so workers that are employed in an area with high social vulnerability have limited access to health care services due to lack of resources or inadequate health care infrastructure. So this can uh, uh, result in delayed health care, um, leading to increased health risks, reduced well-being, and um, possibly absenteeism of the organization. Uh, the third example is financial or economic stability, instability. Um, workers employed in these areas with high SVI may face economic uh, instability due to factors such as poverty, limited access to education and training, um, which can then lead to financial stress and it can um, impact their anxiety and mental health, which again can impact organizational outcomes such as productivity and the quality of the work that they are producing. And that's one, social support. Um, people that have limited social support systems um, can impact their overall wellness, which can also impact organizational outcomes. So employers can create safer, more supportive work environments that benefit employees in the wider community 
by prioritizing worker well-being and addressing the unique experiences of workers that are socially vulnerable. Next slide, please. So what can employees and employers do to promote mental health in the workplace? This is not something that em um, employers just have responsibility over. Employees can also advocate for themselves. Um, so employees can en um, encourage their employer to offer mental health and stress management education and programs. Um, they can participate in those programs when the employer actually implements them. And they can be open minded and respond with emp empathy to coworkers and encourage others to seek mental health resources, which can create um, a culture in the organization that's welcoming. Employers can provide materials such as brochures or videos to educate employees with signs and symptoms of poor mental health. Uh, they can host workshops. Um, they can offer health insurance that has low out of pocket costs for mental health screening and treatment. Um, and also health care, and they can give employees opportunities to participate in decisions um, about issues that affect job stress. And one last one that I would just like to add is um, having access to paid time off and sick time off. Um, some organizations have that, but if you don't create a culture that the manager is willingly telling them, yes, you need to take off to take time for yourself and de-stress, take time off when you're sick, don't come to the workplace. Um, if they don't have that, then employees aren't going to do that and it's going to impact the culture of the workplace. Um, so creating a culture of having those in place, but then also having the managers really enforce that and make the employees feel like they can do um, and take those resources and services. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. And so, um, you know, your presentation really helps to shine a light on some data points and insight that um, really look at the, both the need and the benefit for um, workplace well-being practices and both for the individuals and also our organizations. And so um, now that we have uh, heard the case, uh, for investments in worker well-being, um, we're going to hear from our panelists on some specific strategies to consider. So we're going to go ahead. I will invite our panelists to uh, turn their cameras on and unmute themselves, and we'll uh, start our chat today. Uh, so to guide our discussion uh, with our panelists, uh, we are going to go ahead and use the um, CDC Surgeon General's framework of the five dimensions of worker well-being and mental health that Amanda referenced um, to help kind of frame our discussion. So we're going to go ahead and start talking about um, start with talking about um, employee mental health. And so Julie, we're going to have you start us off. So in thinking about language and reducing the stigma of how we talk about mental health. Um, can you share a little bit about how employers can create a common language to normalize conversations with their employees? And then can you also share about um, how businesses can use the mental health first aid training as a tool to help respond to mental health and substance use challenges in the workplace? So Julie. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Julie Brack, um, and thank you so much for having uh, me today. Yeah, so when we think about common language, it's also important for us to think about where we are located. We're located in the Midwest in which fine, okay, and if we're really spicy, we might say great, right? When asked, how are we? Anything other out of those become borderline oversharing for the culture of the Midwest. And so first and foremost, understand where we're starting, right? So then we can start to um, build that common language within our organizations. So just like many organizations have at least few a few people who are trained for CPR, right? And basic first aid, it's the same for mental health and well-being. Having a few employees that are really um, trained up and mental health first aid responders is a great place to start to make sure that we have people um, who are uh, ready to respond if a crisis arises. 
But before that, there's some great tools out there to use to start to get past fine and get past okay. One of those is feelingwheel.com. And it sounds a little bit elementary, but I was in, actually Maria and I were both in a, a retreat with a business that that's how they opened up their meeting is they passed around the feeling wheel and um, people said where they were on the feeling wheel. And what that does is it gives people options and it's contained. So there's your common language right there. And the way that it's set up is that there's a domain and then within it are all sorts of different choices of words. So the first and foremost is practicing individually how to get past your own fine, okay, and great. How can you show up honestly about where you're at and uh, not feel like you're oversharing. So I'll just give an example. If somebody asked me how I was today, I'd say, um, I feel like I'm coming out of a cold fog. I'm so excited that the sun is shining and I have been anticipating today for weeks. No wind, sunny, and guess where I'm going to be right after this meeting? Out of the sunshine right? I'm not oversharing. I'm just telling you where I'm at. So when you talk with me, you're like, oh, that's right. Julie's already halfway in the sunshine, right? It's level setting. And that's all it is. And so when I'm having a mentally, a mental health day, you'll hear me say, I'm sorry, my brain is foggy today. I'm just going to be a little slower on the uptake. So again, it's just level setting for what's going to happen within that culture and starting to build a culture past fine. That, Julie, and I appreciate um, a tool to help, you know, a strategy to kind of help get past the the fine and okay. And if we're feeling kind of wild and crazy, you know, great. Because um, I think it's, it's a challenge to know how to do that, right? And how to do it differently. Can you talk about um, mental health first aid as a sure. tool and a training? Absolutely. So mental health first aid is a, it's an, it's a global training. I think it was based out of Australia. And I think we have links for that, that we'll share. Um, but there is two forms of training. I'm trained as a mental health responder. So um, that means that if somebody is in crisis, then I have gone through and practiced their assessment. So in CPR, it's the ABCs, assess breath and compression, right? Like are they breathing? Great. Keep them breathing. If they're not breathing and if there's no pulse, then you're doing compression and somebody's calling 911, right? And it's the ABC and you know it over and over. And mental health first aid is the same sort of thing. You have an assessment. You're assessing to see if people are okay, right? And then you're listening non-judgmentally if they are. But you're assessing to make sure is that person able to respond the way that they usually can respond? Are they within that... Um, I don't want to use the word normal because I think that's wrong, but like within their sense of stability, because if they're within their sense of stability, then it's just about talking through and listening and then getting them connected to the right next resource. Okay. If in that assessment, it looks like they are potentially at harm or people around them might be at harm at that point, then you have to get 911 involved. Because again, just like if I'm not trained to give compressions, I need somebody there who can compress and give this person life. It's the same thing for mental health. So the biggest thing that I would say about mental health um, first aid is that you can be trained as a responder or you can be trained as an instructor. And so an instructor then would learn how to teach mental health first aid to anyone within your organization. So the more people you have trained, the more people you have who are responding with that assessment. I'm assessing, I'm listening, I'm engaging, and I'm encouraging, right? How can I encourage you to seek the next right level of care that you need? If somebody severed, a, severed an arm, you're not going to sit there and go, oh, here's a Band-Aid, right? If somebody severed an arm, you're calling 911, you're getting them to the hospital, you're, you're putting on a tourniquet, right? And so that's what mental health first aid does, is it, um, it treats mental health with the same parity at the same parity that we would treat any physical health. And that is first and foremost, is that this is equal, right? We are holistic built beings. We all have mental health. We all have physical health. And much like we the the equation, right? Our well-being depends on how well we're taking care of that. 
And Julie, it sounds like um, mental health first aid. So companies can uh, train someone in their company to be able to have these skills and go through the certification. Um, but they can also work with consultants around this too. Correct. Both of those. Yep. Thank you so much. We're going to go to Maria uh, next. So Maria, um, we know that workplace stress can negatively affect workers through job performance, productivity, uh, work engagement, and daily functioning. So what are some creative ways that employers can think about reducing workplace stress and then how we can rethink the design of our employee assistance programs that many of us have? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to everyone um, here joining us for this conversation. So as a stress management consultant, I like to go into workplaces and start to give options and tools for people to start using to manage stress. So oftentimes, I think we can sometimes get inundated with a lot of information and emails that might share a few ideas, but we know how many emails we're getting a day and how many we're just quite frankly just skimming through and maybe not really getting into. Um, so I love going into places and actually like let's explore tools. So as an occupational therapist, um, kind of in my past career, we're doers, right? And as human beings, I think oftentimes we get so stuck in, you know, I'm, I'm wearing my work hat, I'm wearing my personal hat, but what do you just like to do for fun? So when I like to pose it as a stress management toolkit, I think that can sound a little bit more fun, like, okay, what's in your stress management toolkit as we're coming up with messaging that people can kind of rally around. So that could be anywhere from, you know, grabbing an essential oil. It could be having, you know, music, having on-site places at work where people can go to de-stress and calm. And these spaces don't have to be big, right? I think sometimes we think, oh, what's the cost? I, you know, nobody really wants to maybe put in a spa on site at work. I get that. But how can cre we create these calm, inviting spaces where maybe there's meditation music, maybe there's a yoga mat, maybe there's instructional cards. I think the biggest thing is everybody's different. Um, we're going to lean into different tools. But trying to survey our employees to see what type of tools might they try or can we get them different workshops where they get to explore different things. So I think we can really get creative then to what the each needs of the person are um, and going to the employee assistance programs. I think they're great. I think they have some great built in benefits to support employee wellness. But personally, when I was working in healthcare for eight years, I think sometimes we might talk about the EAP benefits, you know, at HR orientation, and then we maybe don't always revisit that, right? So I, you know, then as, as an employee, you really don't know, okay, what was that EAP again? What would I use that for? You might look at that brochure, and if you're not sure how these things might benefit um, the employee, they might not use them. So I think we just need to kind of relook at how are we sharing those EAP programs? Do they actually have tools that our employees will use? Um, and how can we, we decrease stigma so that it doesn't feel like taboo if we do use an EAP? Yes, and that's really good advice that um, it is very true. As a new employee, you get all of this information um, you're inundated with a lot of information. It's very easy to forget about that benefit. Um, and so to have it kind of strategically revisited, maybe in a staff meeting or something like that in a newsletter, different ways um, as well. So that's great. Um, now I'm going to pivot to our employers who are joining us today. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about building workplace, this dimension um, that Amanda referenced, uh, building workplace connection and community. And so we'll start first with uh, Lena, and then we'll go to uh, Candace. And I see we also have, uh, we have both Charles and Jeff uh, from uh, Albert Lee Select Foods as well uh, joining us. So we have a, a trio here that can respond to that. Uh, but, but we'll start with Lena. So what are some ways that you are working to foster collaboration, teamwork, and belonging in your workplace? 
So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Lena Murphy. I've been with the city of Rochester now for approximately uh, five years or so. Um, so. I've definitely seen our growth in this area of trying to foster this idea of com uh, community teamwork collaboration, um, even breaking down some of our silos. So just last year, we uh, implemented affinity groups. So they're also known as employee resource groups. So you might be more familiar with that terminology. Um, but these are self uh, employee led groups. So they're creating by, sponsored by, championed by employees, uh, and a way to promote some cultural diversity, equity, inclusivity, um, and belonging in the workplace. So teammates can come together and say, you know what, we have this common interest, we have this common identity, or these common characteristics, and we're going to start a, a group together where we meet maybe monthly, maybe every other week. It's all kind of up to them to, to, to to determine that, but it provides them a link to connect with employees that might be outside of their office setting outside of their department, right? So, you know, we've had some fun with it. We have a board games group that meets uh, once a month over lunch. We all love board games. Um, we also have a DEI group that uh, talks about different um, uh, opportunities in the diversity, equity, inclusion space. Um, we have a neat group that's uh, called Sewing for Social Justice. And so they have actually partner and use their skill in sewing and quilting to um, further some social justice causes as well. And we also have a mental health group. Um, I'll say too, um, we also have, uh, aside from that, we also have a wellness committee. Um, so they sponsor a variety of, of events like walking challenge, healthy eating, healthy lifestyle options, lots of free events that are going on in the community are also promoted through this wellness community, uh, wellness committee too. So um, it's a, a way to link with your coworkers to go and attend an event at the art center or attend a free meditation center downtown, uh, med meditation session downtown. So really, really great opportunities. And then I'll say just thirdly, um, we can conduct an employee engagement survey every two to three years. Um, on our most recent survey, we actually included specific questions around DEI, um, but I really like to frame them as questions of belonging. Um, so we're trying to get this baseline understanding of how our employees feel about working for the city of Rochester. So we included things like, I feel safe, I feel welcome at work, you know, I feel like I can be myself at work. And so, yes, it is um, a confidential survey, but it gives us some data points to see, you know, maybe there's um, some some correlation in different departments or different age groups or different uh, longevity with the city. So we can kind of try to address that and target that and get get a little bit more detail. Yeah, and, and Lena, I really, I appreciate the um, affinity groups and um, there, this also sounds like opportunity for belonging and fun uh, as well. Fun is so important. And I have recently heard about a strategy for smaller companies coming together to start affinity groups for their employees, right? So you don't have to be a large company. Um, this idea that, you know, smaller companies can collaborate together on behalf of their employees, if that's something of interest. Um, and then I really like your um, employee engagement survey, how you are incorporating a component of belonging. Um, you know, in there as well to really kind of see and start to look at, you know, what is the pulse of how people are feeling. Yep. So I think that's great. Um, so now let's go to Albert Lee Select Foods. And I see we have Charles and um, I think Jeff is also here and we yep. have um, Candace. So we have three folks that could potentially respond um, to the question. So, so the question is, um, what are some ways that you are working to foster collaboration teamwork and belonging at Albert Lee Select Foods? Well, some of the ways that we're we're doing that, and I'm going to take this portion because I like the fun things. So um, Sounds we have good. A, lot of, uh, a lot of holiday celebrations, potlucks, and even like this Christmas, we had um, a Korean choir come in and uh, sang carols during our Christmas celebration here. And it was amazing to us that every single um, young person in that um, in that choir were members of uh, were children of people that worked here. So it was really a neat deal. Uh, we have pool tables here in our common area. We have uh, pool tournaments throughout the uh, throughout the year. Um, one of the best things that I can honestly say we ever did because um, it really opened up my eyes was we had uh, an art contest. And um, for you 
that don't know what we do here. We we cut pork and package pork products for a customer. So it is very strenuous work. It's long hours. And uh, one thing that I found was once you get to know people, some people that uh, you might walk by every day have just some unique abilities. I might think of them as a employee that, uh, you know, converts ribs for us. But once we started this art contest, it was amazing the talent that came out of it. Uh, we had a whole bunch of sculptures, paintings, everything else. We provided all the necessary uh, tools to um, create their art. And we had the Elderly Art Association come in and um, we had a contest and they um, awarded prizes. But the interesting thing about this was um, that the Elderly Art Association was so impressed with the, the art exhibit that we had here at our facility, they opened up a new art um, gallery um, in Elbert Lee, and their first exhibition was the art that was produced here at Elbert Lee Select Foods. It is unbelievable what these people um, can do, and it would just really open my eyes to, uh, you know, there's, there's, they're employees, but they're also, you know, people that have hidden talents that you would, we would, ne I would never have known that they were that talented, you know, and uh, then it, it morphed into a photography contest and that was highly successful. Um, you know, we, we have monthly meals for everybody where our supervisors actually go out and we prepare the meals right in the um, um, lunchroom for our employees to partake in. Uh, we've had chili contests, uh, salsa contests. Uh, we had a community garden for a while here. We ripped up um, our backyard and um, I had a farmer come in and rip it up. And uh, we had a community garden for a long time. And it is just amazing uh, just to get to know people on a different level other than just an employee, but uh, you know, and that's what we're about here. We're more of a family. I know we have 450 employees here, but you know, it just seems like everybody just just loves one another. If you come into um, our facility at lunch break and you walk through our lunch room, there'll be five, six people asking you if you need something to eat. I mean, it's just it's just a, such a such a welcoming community, and and it just makes me proud to be a part of it. And you know. It's such a diverse culture that we have here and and you can learn so much and it, it makes me a better human. It, it has. So that's just some of the things that we're doing here. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. That all sounds amazing. And I understand in talking with you, you have a large Karen uh, community that works for you. And so, you know, your example of having um, Corinne carols coming, you know, uh, students coming and singing and, you know, um, having your employees share their culture, um, sharing over food. You talked about, you know, pool tables and having fun uh, and also being able to share, right, the other dimensions of of who we are as human beings, like art, right? And yes. um, we can communicate a lot of other things through things like art. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna pivot. We're gonna stick with our employers for this next question. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, what sorts of uh, practices, policies, and investments are you implementing to optimize employee health and well-being in your workplace? So we're going to start with Albert Lee Select Foods on this one. And so whomever would like to share a little bit about uh, practices, policies, and investments around well-being. I know you have a lot. There's a lot to share. So, Well, I'll start and I'll let Candace take over. Um, the reason I'm I'm on the start is that I've I've been here for 17 years when since the plant opened, and I think the main practice, one of the best practices that we have, is an open door policy. And you know a lot of people say they have an open door policy, but um, I, I'm going to tell you about myself. I've been with big corporations. I worked for Throwing Up a Valley, and there was a lot of red tape, just like the big companies, but. There is no, no such thing as red tape here. If you want to talk to the boss, you go talk to the boss. 
Um, and you don't have to just talk to them about a problem at work. You can go talk to them about anything. And when I mean the boss, I don't just mean just Jeff. I mean, you can talk to the owner. That's that's how deeply um, our policy goes is that we have truly have an open door policy. Um, and I think that's led to um, where we're at today with the things that Jeff talked about. Uh, and some of the things that we've invested in is we've invested in, um, the first thing I'll talk about is that we have invested in the free clinic for the employers. We've had a free clinic with basic health for employees from the first day they walk in the door. Um, they don't have to sign up for anything. We tell them about it in orientation. And you know, one of the one of the things we found out is that a lot of people don't utilize healthcare because they don't have they haven't invested in an insurance policy, so they're afraid to go to the doctor. And one of the things that we have emphasized is that we don't care if you have insurance. We want you. If you have a problem, get it taken care of. Go see the doctor. Get well. Come back. Um, you don't have to pay for it. And I mean, there's such a stigma from employees that I don't have insurance. I can't take care of myself. And they're out sick and they don't want to get a bill. They don't want to be in debt because, you know, nobody wants to be in debt. But we want them to, we, we have to really invest in learning people about the free health clinic. And it's been such, such a blessing to all of our employees to have that clinic um, because you can go over there and they'll see you for your blood pressure, run to test your doctor's one, give you free prescriptions, do all those things that they need done. So we've, we've invested in that. We have, we've invested in having an on-site RN um, and um, she takes care, you know, she takes care of our employees the way a mother would take care of their children. Um, and I mean that that if somebody is sick at home and they don't have the means to, to get help, she go to their house. She go to their house, see what see what's going on with them, and tell and then come back and she'll tell me, "Hey Charles, I had to go see some such and such." Um, you know, during the pandemic, she took food to people houses that couldn't get out of the house. So, it, one of the one of the thing that and open door policy foster is a family a family environment. And that's that's what we really want. At one time before Candace came, I could tell you every employee's name in this plant. And I could tell you every employee's number in this plant. And, and so Cand when they come up to see Candace sometimes to sign up for 401k and I go, oh, his number is blah, blah, blah. And Candace go, how do you know that? Because that's the level of personability we want with our employees. We want to know we care about every aspect of their health, their well-being, what they're doing, how their family's doing. Uh, you know, we 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 um, we've really invested heavily on that. Now, Candice, you want to talk about onboarding? Oh, onboarding. Yeah. Expanding on onboarding and support and mentoring the program that we have for our employees. Because we we've changed our onboarding practice. We used to. Um, we we didn't have the level where we have people come in and onboard them and talk about. Uh, they sit down with Candace and uh, at first I used to be in like a little cubby hole, uh, eight by eight or ten by ten or whatever it is, and we decided that that's not the way we want to onboard people. So I I got to move to a big office and we have. We have popcorn machine, we have refreshments in there. People come in and say, hey, sit down, you want popcorn or you want this, or you want that? And then we talk, you know, we interview them and we we want to make sure that they are, are welcome the first day that they come in. That's where it starts. That's where our open door policies start is day one. We want to make sure people come in and they feel welcome, they feel accepted, and they want to be part of our company. Because, um, for us, uh, that's how an employee learns about what Albert Lee Select Foods is about, right? 
Okay. Anything else you want to add to what I said? No, it's good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, and and I, you know, we hear a lot, right, about onboarding experiences really can set the tone for how somebody feels about working for you, right? Absolutely. And and I know when uh, we chatted, um, and Jeff, maybe this was a conversation um, with you, but. Um, you specifically talked about you have a strategy for onboarding where you actually slow the whole timeline down. You're not trying to just inundate with a lot of information. You, you're slowing the timeline down and you're checking with people about, you know, how are they feeling? You know, um, how are they understanding things and and just um, making sure that there was, there's a relationship component in there. I, I don't know if but... Jeff was talking what would say but I'm going to tell you yeah we have slowed our onboarding process down um okay, so they come in then they get hired but for the first week um the first week every, no the first three weeks I'm sorry I'm misquoting myself the first three weeks we take the time every morning to talk to every single new hire that's hired for that first three week time and as the supervisors are down there, they're talking about talking about, you know, how you doing, how you feeling, what's what's what uh, do you want to talk about? But it also gives them a chance to learn who their supervisors are, because, you know, that's, you know, learning who the person that is telling you what to do, his name is, we think, very vital. Um, so you would want to make sure, you know, when you ask somebody, who's your supervisor? I don't know. He's just a guy or he's just a lady. I don't know who they are. We think that's so important that from that first three week people per period that they get to know each other, supervisor and employee. Because I, I remember when I started way back in this business um, 40 years ago, um, you were never it was never personal. It was just hey, you come here. And, you know, I'm so happy that we don't do that here. We we want to know, we want to know, like I said, from day one, we want to know who you are, how your family is, and you know, um, show them. It's not just to show them, it's that we want them to know that we care about them, not just because they can do product. You know, we do product, but product isn't our business. People is our business. We might put out two million pounds of product, but we know that the people that do that for us are our business and cultivate. Our main priority is. Any more? You want to add to that? Come on. Well, <laughs> we we might get we might get you to share during our unplugged then hopefully uh, in a little bit. So so I really liked um, product is in our business. People are our business. I love that. And I really think, you know, what you're describing is that building relationships and trust takes time too, right? It's like doing things right. a little bit differently. Um, so Lena, let's hear from you um, around practices, policies and investments um, that you are implementing to optimize uh, health and well-being. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Maria, I know mentioned the employee assistance programs. And so we also have employee assistance programs, but, you know, to your point of like, do you just give someone a card, right? A, a, a 800 number when they're going through something that's maybe a crisis or having some emotional difficulty. Um, what we found is that promoting it along the way, you know, throughout like supervisor chats is promoting it in, in the newsletter, but also asking employees who have utilized it voluntarily um, to, to share about their experience, their positive experience uh, with the AP has really been great. Um, we've had employees just on their own come to HR and said, you know, I, I needed this, it was great and it was wonderful. And so then we asked them to, if they're willing to share that more widely. Um, and also just noting our, our EAP provides support to family members as well. And so that was a key thing to make sure employees knew that. Um, not uh, Many employees just thought it was for themselves, but once they learned that it was for family members or children, you know, those that was a great resource for them to have as well. 
Um, another item that I definitely would love to highlight is our chaplaincy program here with the city. So um, our actually our police department started off with a chaplaincy program. They partnered with a different organ, a separate organization to provide services to our first responders. Right, they're dealing with a lot of crisis situations, very difficult situations um, going on to scenes. So this great chaplaincy program provides provides support to them. They'll actually um, go to the scene of an accident as well and follow up with our police officers. Um, our fire department then implemented just last year a volunteer um, volunteer chaplaincy program. So we actually put out notice and invited anyone in the community that was interested that was um, a certified chaplain or uh, with, a, with another organization to um, provide support and services to our fire department. So our fire departments have, you know, different houses right around town and they are living together for 24 hour shifts and you get to know, they get to know their teammates. So the chaplains are actually visiting them as well. So they're not only going out to a crisis situation, but they're trying to develop relationships with our firefighters in advance of those crisis um, crisis situations, which is awesome because it develops that relationship and connection and hopefully um, continued interaction if they are going through some or experiencing some difficulty. And then the other thing I just want to highlight with the chaplaincy, you know, it really has been focused on our first responders. But um, a few months ago, we had an incident with one of our other departments. And so there was an accident and um, the chaplaincy program ended up being there because our our um, police department was there, but they were actually able to connect with this other employee as well and really provided uh, great service to this employee who was who was going through a difficult situation. They had continued follow up as well. And we actually invited the volunteer chaplains to one of our other departments um, to counsel our the employees, that person's teammate as well. So um, have had lots of positive impact with that. You know, certainly there's a cost involved, and but we've decided that this cost is um, certainly uh, valuable to the organization. Yeah, thank you so much, Lena. That sounds like a really wonderful benefit for your employees, especially those who might have had trauma and, right, supporting them um, with a non-denominational chaplain. Um, and I think you had said these are members of the community that are trained to serve in this role. I think that's amazing. Um, so we're, we are already getting close to closing our first hour together. So um, I want to uh, close out and share a couple things before we start our unplugged session uh, with our panelists, because we have a lot more to chat about. Um, and so I want to first uh, start off. We're going to be um, closing our recording shortly, but I want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists um, for sharing all your insights today and um, helping the audience to identify strategies to support employee mental health uh, and well-being. And we look forward to continuing this conversation over the next half hour. Um, and then as we can see, our work and personal lives are intrinsically connected, right? And there are many ways that have been highlighted um, so far from our panelists that employers can think about uh, creatively developing strategies that build a culture of well-being. So um, I want to quickly review a few resources uh, before uh, we close out. Um, so uh, our first resource I want to highlight um, comes is the um, National Alliance on Mental, Mental Illness, and they have um, many great training resources for employers. And then the next slide I want to highlight is Mental Health America. Um, they have a great workplace mental health toolkit for businesses. And then our next slide, employers can also think about uh, joining a statewide health improvement partnership or what they call SHIP, a worksite wellness collaborative in their county. So participating employers can partner with local public health departments to receive tools, support, and technical assistance on your worksite wellness, worksite wellness initiatives. So um, in closing, before we start our next part of our session, um, we invite you to fill out a brief evaluation of today's session. And then um, reminding everybody, we'll have a recording of our um, session on our Career Force webpage. And so um, thank you for sticking around for our first hour. We hope you stay for the next half hour. And so I am going to um, hand things over to my colleague, James Whirlwind Soldier, who works in the uh, Northwest region of Minnesota to um, 
share a little bit about a new initiative and then a little bit about our next month's uh, uh, theme. So James. Sorry, folks, of course I left myself on mute. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. This was a great conversation. Um, Adeshewa, can you move it to uh, slide number 26, please? Just want to talk for a second about uh, the, excuse me, the follow your hearts uh, to a caring career campaign. Uh, it has one primary goal, which is to help Minnesota employers attract, hire, and retain people who provide care and support services in people's homes, in the communities, um, and in facilities for people with disabilities and elders. Uh, this campaign, which is called the Caring Career Campaign for short, was developed by the Minnesota Department of Economic. Uh, employment and Economic Development in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Human Services, the Minnesota Department of Health, the Minnesota State Health Force Center of Excellence, local workforce uh, development area staff, industry associations, and many others. So we got a lot of, of individuals and uh, experts involved. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please, Adeshewa? So if this sounds intriguing, on May 11th, to uh, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., Career Force will host an info session uh, for care provider employers about this new initiative. It will be recorded if you can't make it, so we'll make sure that you get a, a copy of that. Um, and we'll talk more about the campaign during that session. We'll talk about the events that are being planned for job seekers, and we'll share specific materials that you can use to support the campaign. Um, the link to register for this event is in the chat. Um, but we'll also make sure to include it in the resources that we share after the event today. Um, and of course, as always, we want to invite you to connect with your local workforce office, your career force office, um, and ask how you can engage directly uh, with this exciting initiative. Uh, next slide, please. And we want to, of course, invite everybody to join us for next month's Workforce Wednesday, which will be on June 7th at the same time. Um, and this uh, specific Workforce Wednesday is going to be centered on uh, the topic of a culture of leadership as a tool for retention. So for this webinar, we want to take a look at how developing staff to be better leaders is actually foundational for attracting and retaining an engaged and happy workforce. Um, it, it, just like today, it, it promises to be a very interesting conversation uh, with hopefully uh, real strategies that you can take back to your organization immediately and start moving that needle. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, thanks to everybody who could join us today for this main session. We would absolutely love it if you could stick around for our unplug session, which will be immediately following this one, um, where we invite you to unmute yourselves, turn your cameras on, and directly ask questions or make comments to our panelists. It's always an engaged conversation. Um, and also, please take time to, to fill out that survey. That information that you provide to us is important uh, and helps us do a better job month after month. Um, for everyone who is uh, registered, we'll be sending you uh, the recording, the slide deck, and also the resources from today's session. So, um, and last but not least, before we start the unplug session, please feel free to reach out to any of us workforce strategy consultants if you have any questions or if we can ever help, um, or if you just want to talk about workforce strategy. We're nerds about that kind of stuff. So, uh, engage us, please, please, please. And so, yeah, with that, I would like to go ahead and just move on to our unplug session. Adeshewa, well, you can stop sharing the slide deck. And like I mentioned previously, if you have questions for our panelists, if you want to make a comment or share a best practice, please go ahead and take yourself off mute and chime in because this is, can be a very, very uh, engaged 